So anyway, I'm going to talk to you about bacteria, parasites, and fungi, oh my, and why we need to be looking at it. Um, and I heard somebody saying they're using salivary testing, which I love that you're using salivary testing. It's a crucial part of what we do, but you will see that you are going to be missing some of the pieces of the puzzle if you're not also incorporating the microscope. All right, the microscope in and of itself is not going to give you all the information and neither is salivary testing. I would love them to be used together uh, that you're going to get the best uh, result uh, and best answers for your patients. Now, a lot of your patients are going to come into your office and they want their 1110 profi. They think they're healthy. Everything is great, but actually they're coming in inflamed and they have some level of perio disease. So how do you talk to your patient and how do you convince them that they are in a disease state? Um, we are not selling them something. We are trying to be healthcare providers. So we're trying to show them x-rays, showing them the bone loss. They don't know what they're looking at. We're doing periodontal charting. And then we show them, look, you see all the green numbers look healthy. All the red numbers are, those are the pockets. And we try to demonstrate it on our sleeve or however. And the, all they see is numbers on a piece of paper. And we show them bleeding. And they still just don't understand what is going on. We try to show them the pictures of their plaque. Yeah, okay, just do my cleaning. And they're looking at you with a lot of apathy or a deer in a headlight, like, yeah, okay. Uh, or they're like, okay, yeah, the doctor wants you to sell me something because he wants another vacation. So yeah, or it's normal for me to go, my gums bleed, it's okay. My Aunt Tilly, her gums always bled and so does my mother's, it's fine. But we know that is a disease state. So we're really frustrated. And how do we explain to our patient that we really need help? And how can I help you? A picture is worth a thousand words, and I'm not necessarily talking That's about this picture, which we all have in our operatories or something like this. And we try to show them the stages of periodontal disease. And then also with the uh, staging and grading of perio now, uh, we try to explain, well, you're grade one, stage three. You know, they don't get it. They need to see what's going on in their mouth. And that's why when they actually see the motility of the bugs, as uh, Dr. Kennedy loves to say, the bad bugs, when they're running around on the screen, the patients are now buying what you're trying to sell them. And you're not trying to sell them. Sell is not a bad word. We use uh, the word sell as a bad word in dentistry. No, we're trying to convince the patient that there is an actual disease process. And looking at this, you can see um, that there is definitely something going on. Oftentimes, when you show your patients, what's going on in their mouth. You wouldn't, don't even have to say anything that they have a disease. They're immediately saying, I don't care what you have to do and how much it costs. I want that out of my mouth. Just whatever you have to do, just do it. So we're like, okay. Now, how, um, why is it important to understand why we need to detect the biofilm? Because most of us, well, I graduated in 1884. So we were trained, it's the calculus and you have to make sure you remove all the calculus, uh, calcaneous deposits and we're um, explain how to uh, and taught how to use your Gracie's and your Columbia's and you know there are technique tests and we make sure we have the glass like surface that was back then they, I know they don't do that anymore thank God but now we know it's not that we really need to pay attention to the biofilm oh well, there's two criteria for periodontal disease you need the pathogenic microflora okay obviously and then you need a susceptible host. Now, who is your susceptible host? Obviously your patient, but the patient, if there is a compromised immune system, i.e. if there's other comorbidities or if there's other medical issues, but even if there isn't, there, there's a good chance there's some level of oxidative stress going on in the body. Oxidative stress is, you know, um, they're not sleeping right, they're not eating well, there's a lot of physical stressors, the kids, the husband, the family, um, you know, micronutrient uh, deficiencies, a lot of um, free radicals. There's, you know, a lot of things that can compromise the immune system of a patient. What happens is now those pathogenic microflora is going to initiate an inflammatory response and that will, that will kick in the patient's immune response. So you can have a patient that could have an abundance of uh, pathogenic bacteria in the curricular space, but they're not showing any clinical signs. Why? Because they have a robust immune system and they're able to fend it off. And then eventually the body will eliminate it. Add it all together, pathogenic microflora will initiate the inflammation. The pathogenic microflora in and of itself does not cause the disease. It initiates inflammation that will 
cause the immune response to kick in and that will cause the connective tissue uh, destruction and bone uh, degeneration. So a lot of times we have that misconception that's the bacteria that's causing the breakdown. Again, you can have two people, one, they both have the same amount of bacteria. One will break down like this and another person will break down very little or not at all, or very, very slowly. Why? It's the, it's the body's immune system, how it's responding. So that's why looking at uh, what bacteria they have and also looking at their response to the bacteria and looking at the medical history as biological hygienists, this is the difference. We don't say, we see A, then we do B. No, we look at the whole picture of the patient. So testing, even the AEP, that you really need to look at the bacteria underneath the gum line because then we can find the end point of therapy. What do I mean by end point of therapy? Meaning they have now been, I don't want to say cured, but now their uh, disease has been arrested. Um, a lot of times you'll have a patient keep coming back often uh, to have skin and loop painting repeated because we've never resolved. And then you have a patient who has refractory perio. As far as I'm concerned, there's no such thing as a refractory perio. Refractory perio is a perio that was never really fully resolved, or that's a period that a uh, patient's getting re-inoculated and their immune system is compromised. So how do we address that? So it's not just keep doing SRP on that patient. It's about how do we boost the immune system of that patient and how do we prevent that patient from getting continued to be uh, inoculated with the pathogens. Um, here the CDC is giving you statistics of what you know, about 50%, I'd say more, about 80% of the population have a level of periodontal disease. And they're saying, well, usually if you're over 65, you have a 70% increase of, um, you know, getting perio. Okay, yeah, there's a lot of factors. Now, another thing, that's, the funny thing that the CDC says, you know, we're not even going to get into how I feel about this, but uh, they say that bacteria in the mouth infect the tissue surrounding the tooth, causing the inflammation around the tooth. And then if you don't remove it and hardens into tartar, calling it calculus, and that can spread below the gum line. And then only a dental hy a hygienist or a dental professional can remove the tartar and stop the periodontal disease. Okay, first you're telling me it's the bacteria in the mouth that causes the inflammation and the periodontal disease. But now you're saying it's the tartar and we have to remove the tartar. Which one is it? I'm confused here. Like, with, you make up your mind, and I'm gonna here to tell you, it's not the calculus. It's the biofilm. You have, you have to modulate that biofilm. Now, remember, I graduated in '84, and back then it was all about the calculus. It was not. They didn't talk about the biofilm at all. What are we using now that is or that we're using as diagnostic markers for a patient who has uh, periodontal disease? How are we deciding if they have perio or not? And I'm going to have a little bit of a, um, I'm going to hopefully cause a little brain shift for you guys, because a lot of your healthy patients that you have are not healthy. I'll explain to you what I mean in just a minute. What are we using? Disclosing solution, radiographs, pocket depth estimates. When I say pocket depth estimates, that is your periodontal probing, bleeding on probing and tissue character. Disclosing solution, what is it doing? Even with you doing GPT, you know, the guided biofilm therapy, which is beautiful, you know, you're using the two toner, it doesn't matter. You're, you're staining um, anaerobic supergingival plaque. That's not showing me what is subgingival. Okay, yeah, there's a lot of supergingival. Yeah, and then of course it will eventually go subgingivally and then the plaque in and of itself or the bacteria in and of itself can modulate its environment and change it to a very oxygen deprived environment. So what it's important to know what's going on above, but at that moment, I don't know what's going on underneath. I need something more. I, this is not giving me enough information. Now, radiographs, if you're taking x-rays. It doesn't show me if there's any mercurial risk because if it's the biofilm, I need to know what the biofilm is. It's only documenting historical damage, meaning if I see uh, you know, vertical or horizontal defects, damage is already done. Don't I want, uh, as a preventive specialist, as a holistic or biological hygienist, don't I want pre to prevent disease? I, don't, I want to prevent it. I don't want to treat symptoms of a disease. I want to prevent it. So x-rays are not giving me any good indicator of whether a patient's at risk, unless they, I see an area where they're has um, loss of lamina dura. Intact lamina dura is great. If you have a loss of lamina dura, there's a good chance that's going to unzip a little bit more, much faster. Also, 
periodontal probing. This started back in 1925. Um, Dr. Uh, Bill Landers uh, loves to call them metal sticks. Uh, he doesn't call them a probe, he calls them a metal, notched metal stick, uh, because basically that is not a good uh, indicator of disease. A pocket is not a disease, it is the sequela of a disease, meaning nobody has been born with a six millimeter pocket. Every pocket started with either one, two, or three millimeters. We are all, nature has made us with either one, two, or three, depending on where it is in the mouth, of course, we all know what it is. It doesn't automatically become a six unless there is other factors, whether it be um, you know, mechanical, you know, ill-fitting crowns, uh, restorations, or if it's a uh, food disease process. By the time the pocket is measurable, the bone has already been lost. As a preventive specialist, as a biological hygienist, I want to prevent that from happening. Now, if a patient comes to me with that existing condition, then I need to arrest it and potentially, hopefully, re reverse it. Shallow sites are not productive. Okay, all pocket beginners are now uh, shallow sulci, obviously, and conversely, a deep pocket. Now, this may sound a little bit strange to you guys, but you can have a five millimeter pocket perfectly healthy. Perfectly healthy. There's no pathogens and there's no uh, active disease going on in there. I've seen it a multitude of times. Um, so just because there's a five millimeter pocket, we don't have to start doing gum amputations, um, i.e., you know, uh, full thickness flaps and, and such. You can actually um, maintain that given, you know, as long as the patient's medical history is good. Again, that's it's more in your learning about biological uh, dental hygiene. Bleeding on probing. We use that as an indicator for SRP. If the patient has any kind of disease process, it not, it's not always the case. How many of us have seen a patient, you know, especially a young woman who could be in her menses or is pregnant, pregnancy gingivitis or hormonal, hormonally induced gingivitis, um, patients who are taking any kind of blood thinners, you know, any kind of, are they taking ASA on a daily basis? You know, even if it's just 81 milligrams, uh, of ASA, you know, there's a lot of other factors that can cause uh, capillary fragility. It doesn't necessarily have to be bacterial unless I am looking for it. If I see it, then I know it. If I do, if I see, if I take the slide and I don't see anything on the slide and they're bleeding, then I need to look at their medical history, start asking more questions. This is where, this is where you start to become more of a whole body health provider and not just providing what's going on here between the nose and the chin. That's where you become a whole body health care provider. So, tissue characteristics. When you have bleeding, it's not reliable. We just discussed that. Also, gingivitis. There are other factors that can cause gingival irritation. And here's a whole list of them for you. Smoking, Invisalign, xerostomia, uncontoured restorations, that's mechanical uh, irritation, CPAP devices, dry, the whole, gamut. So we can't use just what we see clinically as the indicator. I need to see what is actually causing the problem. So our traditional tests, periodontal disease and periimplantitis is an infection caused by pathogenic bacteria. And do you really think you can diagnose an infection with a notched metal stick? No, it only gives you an indicator of what you see right now or what is historical damage it only detects it after the disease. So why are we waiting to treat a patient until I have a five millimeter? So I'm, I'm gonna go there, insurance companies will not pay for a patient to have treatment unless they have a five millimeter pocket and radiographic bone loss, radiographic calculus. Why are we waiting for the patient to have a disease? It, it just blows my mind how we're just ignoring the prevention that we can be doing to help our patient. Oh. Being said, how do we get these bad bugs? Well, it's usually, usually the mom gives it to us. So the mom, if the mom is positive, she's, you know, they give it to the kid, of course. If the mom's infected, the, the child is at a higher risk of obviously uh, contracting it. Same thing with strep mutans. Oral cavity is always stole at birth, and then we introduce it. Um, periodontal disease is communicable. When I first graduated, we didn't know that. It was about a year or two after that is when we found out that it is a communicable disease. And the major transmission is through saliva. So remember, it's through saliva. So 
there's, there's three major ways to transmit it, but then there's other ways also. Bacterial exchange, bring an intimate kiss. I'm sorry if you guys, uh, if your husbands get, or your significant others get mad at you later, if you don't want to kiss them, <laughs> because there's about 80 million microbes that are going to be transferred during a 10 second French kiss. A heck of a lot. So that being said, um, you know, I'll tell you a story about my son in a little while later. So, but anyway, <laughs> some of the collective bacteria, it can collect on the tongue, um, on the cheeks, uh, and the, the posterior part of the mouth. So it can actually find other places to hide and help. It can actually reinfect the, the rest of the mouth and other sides of the teeth. Very quick study. This was done in um, Sweden. You had two different kids and two different families. Both had periodontal disease. There was no history of periodontal disease in the family. So there goes the, the whole thing about transmission from the parents to the kids. There was none. Um, what was their source of the infection? There was no, yeah, everybody else was negative. Took monthly planks, plaque samples for a year, like every three, six, uh, nine, 12 months. And um, it turns out they both had dogs. And the dogs came from the same litter. Two totally different families, but the dogs had the same strain of ectonomycotin comitans. So basically they got infected, not from the parents, but from their animals. Oh, that being said, where do we get this stuff? How do we get infected? It is basically mothers, lovers, and pets. So if you're letting a little spot issue, which I mean, I've had, I used to have a dog and of course we love to play with our puppies. I would probably suggest that we may not want to do that because uh, they do lick other things <laughs> other than, you know, giving you a kiss. So, you know, that being said, I don't mean to be gross, but it's true. Uh, so that's a big source of transmission. Um, another, other sources of transmission are shared spoons, forks, glassware, because if, again, if the vector is saliva, uh, the source of transmission, you can actually pass it back and forth through um, cupware. Now, you know, like how many times, you know, moms, the patient, you know, if the child has one of the, you know, I don't know what you remember, what you call them, the nippies or whatever, and the kid drops it. And then the mom will suck on it and stick it right back in the patient's mouth. Oh, the kid's mouth rather. Oh my God, no, don't do that. So that being said, there's way, different ways of getting infected. Also, it can come from um, uh, fruits and vegetables. There are studies that show that you can find it. You can get like uh, Entamoeba gingivalis and um, other uh, parasites and uh, bacteria from fruits and vegetables that are not cleaned well. Actually, there's... Um, I know uh, Entamoeba gingivalis uh, specifically uh, from fruits and vegetables. So that being said, making sure a lot of our crunchy uh, patients that are using uh, or making themselves self smoothies, making sure that they're thoroughly washing their fruits and vegetables, uh, soaking them uh, with, in lemon water for about 15 minutes or vinegar uh, and water, uh, baking soda and water, uh, with however they clean it, make sure they're thoroughly, thoroughly cleaning their fruits and vegetables because you will find stuff on their, on their uh, microscope slide. How many oral species? There's about 500 to 1,000, constantly increasing. And in the mouth, there's only about 100 to 200 uh, present in any moment. You can have something on the mesial of a tooth and then a different species on the distal of the tooth. So it's not concurrent to the whole mouth. And what you have on the upper left could be, you know, be something totally different on the lower right, and then everything was, uh, can certainly move around. Okay, I'm gonna go through this kind of quick because I don't wanna waste time because I wanna make sure we get to the really good stuff. This is just telling you that within six hours of your patient leaving their operatory, you are going to have a full pathogenic biofilm. If we're not modulating that biofilm and the fact that we are so lucky that we have the ability to use ozone, the patients are going to be, never going to be um, rectified or, or reverse their periodontal disease because they're, they're going to constantly just get reinfected. Um, so given that the patient gets reinfected so easily, do we spend those extra couple of seconds or minutes trying to remove that last spicule of calculus, or do we spend the time in educating the patient how to modulate their biofilm at home? i.e. proper brushing, flossing, water picking, interdental brushing, et cetera, whatever you think that patient needs. So 
you have to disrupt the biofilm. And then once the biofilm is disrupted, it takes a while for it to regrow. So the, even if it's not thoroughly, thoroughly removed, which is hopefully the best thing we could do, but patients have limitations. If As long as they're modulating it, disrupting it, it takes too long for them to um, get it to uh, uh, reform. Why is SRP a problem without paying attention to the biofilm? Here they did a study, 57 patients, three to six months, nine month monitoring. They checked the redness levels. It did not, it hardly changed. It's only 11% improvement. That's not enough. Bleeding on probing reduction, only 6%. That's nothing. Why? Because we're only removing calculus. We're not modulating the biofilm. If I say bi modulating the biofilm one more time, you can hit me, but that's so, it's so important that we do that. It's crucial as part of what we do. This is, this is you didn't even do anything. How many times do you have a patient that comes back and they're still bleeding and inflamed? A little better, but not much. That's why. Attachment level gains. You only got 6% imp uh, 6 improvement. That's why it needs to be repeated all the time. It's your treatment, the symptoms, you're not treating the cause. Removing calculus is not treating the cause because you're leaving the pathogens behind. So how do we find the bad pathogens by using salivary testing and by using the microscope? You're removing about 83% of the biofilm when you're uh, doing a hygiene appointment in a one to three millimeter pocket. If you have up to a, uh, like a three to five millimeter pocket, you're moving about 58% of the biofilm. You're still leaving about 42% behind. If anything over five millimeters, you are removing only 11% of the biofilm. You're leaving 89% of the biofilm behind. So your patients that you're doing uh, SRP on that have five, six, seven millimeter pockets, you're leaving all that behind. And that's why they're not getting any better. Even PG and AA, feed on blood, so if there's a lot of bleeding in the pocket, they're only gonna just proliferate. This is why I believe the ozone is part of your, your uh, armamentarium is crucial. The microse is anaerobic, uh, excuse me, uh, aerobic, uh, gram, uh, gram positive, but it's still um, a pathogen. Basically no change, it's left behind. PG nivalis, you only removed 41%. So, if we detected all of the infections, how many patients would you be able to treat? The biofilm, it's not the calculus. I'm kind of going through this a little quick. I'm sorry, I adjusted my, my slide deck, but I'm running late on time. If anybody wants uh, me to review this with them a little bit slower, you let me know, that's not a problem. You can't detect infections with a stick. You can only treat it if you know what's going on in there. And that's why you're using the phase contrast microscope. This is a nice, this is an example of a setup, different types of microscopes. You can have a monitor that's hooked up onto the, onto the um, microscope itself, because I heard somebody saying, well, they don't have, really have the room for it. You can have a much larger monitor. You can have a smaller monitor. You can have a monitor that's hooked up onto the microscope, has a much smaller footprint. Um, there's different varying types of microscopes that you can use. I mean, size of microscopes, you need to use a face contrast. You can't use any other. Uh, the reason by meaning, meaning, uh, meaning is the phase contrast microscope you have to use because it, it the wavelength of the light is being slowed down and it causes the um, bacteria to be seen without staining them. Because in the old time, you would have to stain bacteria to see it. And what would happen, it would kill the bacteria and you wanna see it living. So oh, this doctor found a way, uh, not doctor, he was a mathematician. He found a way to uh, be able to see something living and keep it alive and still see it by refracting the light and slowing the light wave. So it almost makes it look like a negative. You know, the old time way we used to take pictures, not the digital, and used to get the negative strips. That's basically almost what you, uh, what it looks like. Oh, advantages, air side, minutes, within a minute. It only takes, you say a lot of times when patients like um, hygienists will say, it's gonna take a lot of time from my already filled uh, regime. At most, it, it took me maybe two minutes at most, because once you get it down pat, so easy to do. 
it detects white blood cells. White blood cells in and of itself is an indicator of periodontal disease. You're going to be able to see all 57 types of spirochetes. And it, this, is the, this is the huge part of it. It's patient motivation. Patients that would have said no to treatment before are now saying yes. And it's cheap. At the end of the day, if you get uh, your patients to accept the treatment that they need, it's, the microscope is going to pay for itself in no time. Because the only disadvantage is that there is a little bit of a learning curve, which there is with everything, right? And the scopes can range from a couple thousand uh, all the way up to seven. You know, uh, you can have the Rolls Royce of the scopes, you know, that have a Bluetooth uh, connector to a iPad and all that stuff. If you like those bells and whistles, great. It's not necessary. Um, you can definitely get that paid for in no time uh, it's by having patients accept the treatment that they need because once they see the bugs, they want the therapy. All right, for those of you who do have a microscope or those of you who are looking to get a microscope and they're struggling, how do you prepare a slide? You need, of course, your slide, you need a solution. Now you don't necessarily have to use solution. You can use the patient's saliva. You milk the saliva gland underneath the tongue and use the back of the mirror, and then you can take a little bit of that cold saliva and put it on your slide. I, again, I personally prefer to use the solution because I just didn't have time to milk the saliva gland. I just didn't, if patient has dry mouth or if they have viscous, viscous saliva, or, you know, I didn't want to have a lot of bubbles. I got to worry about the bubbles in it. But again, everybody's different. Everybody does their thing. I personally made the solution for me was just easier. So drop of the solution, you'll have your glass cover and you have the adhesive. The reason why you use the adhesive is because you don't want any oxygen to get on the slide. So with your actual slide, you do not want to grab it um, on its, uh, its flat surface. You want to grab it on its edges because you don't want your fingerprints on there because you will get your oils onto the, onto the slide and you will uh, disrupt your, um, your sample. We don't care about the thickness of the glass cover, actually. So the preserve the motility, you're going to use the solution and, ex and extend the sample. You can take a sample in the morning and you'll be able to look at it later in that afternoon and you still have motility. And what's nice about this solution, it has the same pH of the curricular space because you do not want to use um, distilled water or saline solution because it's going to kill your bacteria or your parasites because um, the distilled water is hypotonic or the normal saline is gonna be hypertonic because be too much salt or not enough salt. What's gonna happen is if, there, if you have something that has the same pH and the same salinity as saliva, you're gonna have great um, uh, homeostasis and you're gonna be able to preserve the integrity of the bacteria and the cells. If you have a higher salt content outside, outside you're gonna pull the water out of the cell and then you're gonna cause it's called cremation, and you'll see that a lot on uh, slides. Your red blood cells, it looks like spores. I'm like, what is there? Was that a spore? No, it's a cremated uh, blood cell. And if there's, um, you know, lower salt content outside, uh, salt inside the, uh, inside the cell, rather, you're actually going to get water pulled in, and it's going to cause the, the um, cell to explode. So you're going to place one drop. You're going to pull your samples. You're not going to keep them separately. You're going to keep them together in one spot. The reason being is um, you want to keep them aggregated. And when you're doing is you're not going to stir it up. You don't want to play with it. Do not mix or disrupt it. Because like I said, what's here today will be here tomorrow and vice versa. There's no need to do it separately unless you're looking for something specific in one isolated spot. That's a different story. Um, but when you place your sample on the slide, you are not going to mix it. You do not want to disrupt your sample. I'm going to talk to you about that, about why in just a minute. Where do you take your samples? You're going to take it from the apical third. Do not take it from the just underneath the margin or at the margin, margin because that's your aerobic bacteria. I don't care about it. And that's where your materia alba is. I don't care about that. I want to see what's at the apical third. That's where you're going to be your most oxygen deplete area, and that's where your, your um, most pathogenic bacteria are going to live. You wanna make sure you avoid any calculus because that's gonna prevent your slide cover from um, laying flat on your slide. Also, when you're taking your sample, we all hygienists, we know how to keep our lip blade closed. You insert, and then you're gonna open it slightly, not 
open it enough that you're going to scale. You do not want to engage your blade on the surface of the tooth. You want to open it just enough and you're going to scoop out that biofilm. Even if you don't see anything on your uh, curette tip, it does not matter. It, there's a good chance there's something there because everything is again is microscopic. So some will want to keep going back in the pocket until they can actually see something there. That's not necessary because then at, at that point, you're getting a lot more epithelial cells, you're getting materia alba, you're causing bleeding, no need for that. So you're gonna transfer it gently and you're not gonna disrupt the samples. I'm gonna show you why when you see the sample. And because it, it shows you risk assessment, because if you have a mature biofilm, you're gonna to start to see quorum sensing and you're gonna to start to see an aggregation of the bacteria, meaning they're gonna to start to line up with each other and they're gonna to start to um, uh, move in the same direction. So if you have a slide and you start to see that, then you know this, is, this patient has a long chronic infection and you're gonna treat them a little bit differently than you would somebody who has a nascent uh, or early uh, disease process. So it's important not to disrupt your samples. So I personally like to take them from um, the posterior areas you know, even if a patient only has premolars, I take it from the, you know, the, the last or the terminal molars. I like to go into proximally into the coal space. You do whatever is comfortable for you, but I like to get into proximally in the coal because that's obviously where it's going to be harder for any of my patients to uh, be able to reach. And that's where I'm going to get, you know, the baddest of the bad, whatever's in there. So you can do is uh, like if you have a patient who came in with uh, periimplantitis in one area, they're highly inflamed. And you want to do that one site specific, it's fine. Um, but usually I would do the whole mouth or quadrant. Handle it by the edges. You're going to flick your um, glass covers to separate them. And you're going to put it at a 45 degree angle to let it fall. That way you're going to have the oxygen, uh, excuse me, you're not going to trap any of the oxygen or air um, underneath that glass cover. And you're going to press down. So that way you get, you can spread out your sample, but you don't want to disrupt it too much. You're going to push down, compress, and you're doing it on paper towel, then you're going to flip it over and then you're going to press it again because you want to just any excess solution because I think any of us that have done the slides have accidentally put a little bit too much solution on there, maybe once or twice or several times, and you want to get, just want to blot that all up, right? So you just make sure you get all that excess fluid out and then you turn that back over. You want to just firmly enough to blanch your finger because that way you can get a nice thin sample because you're going to be looking at it on the microscope. You're going to be um, trying to do their focus and it's going to be almost like an MRI looking at different levels. You've got the focal plane. So the thinner it is, the easier it is to look at. And plus, if it's not pressed down enough, the fluid is going to flow and it looks like you have rivers running on your, on your, um, on your slide. And then you're going to use your sealant and you're going to use it around your edges because it will help prevent any oxygen from getting underneath the glass cover. Make sure you thoroughly cover the edges. Okay. You want to wait about 10 to 20 minutes. So now you're going to have your focal plane. You're going to be able to move your focus up and down to be able to really see what's going on in there. And what are you going to see? You're going to look for your white blood cells. White blood cells are an indicator of disease, whether it be a localized disease or even potentially a systemic issue. There are a lot of times if you don't see any pathogenic bacteria on a slide, but you do see a lot of white blood cells, that is something that maybe you might want to tell your doctor or you can even say to the patient yourself, you know, I see a lot of white blood cells on your, on your slide. Maybe you need to see your PCP or see your, your functional medicine or your, your naturopath or whomever they're seeing. You know, maybe they need to look at what's what's going on. There's something causing your body to react, your immune system kicking in and throwing out a lot of white blood cells if you don't see pathogens. You're going to see spirochetes. You're looking for gliding rods. You are looking for a candida, which is an opportunistic. So that in and of itself is not uh, causative, but um, could be a, a, a problem also. You're going to also look for trichomonads, which are parasites and amoeba, which has now been shown to be causative. Uh, for many years, they did not know what their um, indication was in periodontal disease. In April of 2020, they did come out with a study that proved that it is causative of periodontal disease. 
So you want to be able to find your amoeba, which you're not going to find on salivary testing. What are we looking for? Here you're gonna find ep um, epithelial cells. Very normal. This means you've got a good apical sample. A lot of times patients are like, what is that? Oh, I said, oh, that's a skin cell because you're sloughing skin cells all day long through a whole body. And that means we got a good sample because I really got to the bottom of, of your pocket. Very easy. Now, okay, we're talking about pathogens. Well, what about a healthy patient? Because my goal is I want all my patients to have a healthy slide. But what am I looking for? This is basically a lot of nothing. Now, if you see here, just give me one second. I want to get my laser pointer here. You can see there was like one spirochete, like it looks like there's one spirochete over here. This is not a very clear picture. Sorry about that. But there was like one spirochete, but for the most part, there's non-modal rods and a lot of like dots. That's a big air bubble. This is materia alba. This is a lot of nothing. You have one spirochete. I have one spirochete and this is 400 times magnification. And I have a lot of good nothingness. This patient is good. I might say, well, you know, I found a spiky here or there. That means you have a lot of good bacteria and it's not allowing that bad bacteria to express itself, which is great, but I still really want to make sure that you're not getting it, you know, through, you know, from kissing your husband or through the dog or anything, but so make sure you really stay on top of your home care because I don't want that to continue to proliferate and, and, and get any worse. This is a great slide. That's a non-modal rod. We don't necessarily know what that is. A lot of materia alba. You can see um, that potentially is a food particle or a calculus, I'm not sure. But you can see I have some movement. I'm trying to get a clear picture here. You can see some movement, but there's really nothing here. We're trying to really look hard to try to find something bad. There's nothing here. This is a good slide. There's nothing to talk about. Simple as that. So you'll, you'll be able to, once you do your slides enough, you're gonna, you're gonna know the difference. I don't see any motility. I don't see any of the high risk. You know, you're good. And you see clinically the patient's tissue is healthy. Um, there's no bleeding on probing. I know we just talked about that's not necessarily an indicator, but I mean, if all the puzzle pieces are making sense, then you know that patient's a healthy patient because you're not seeing any of the bugs running around. White blood cells. They did a study. They showed that white blood cells in and of itself can be used as a diagnostic marker for periodontal disease. And it also is a marker for a um, increase of uh, systemic inflammation um, and cardiovascular disease. So if you just see a whole bunch of white blood cells, that itself is a periodontal risk. That's why you want to see them. Now, if you see something that something that is round and it has that those cytoplasmic granules in them, it almost looks like they're effervescing. That these this is a sea of white blood cells. You see how everything looks like it's effervescing? White blood cells. Now, when I say white blood cells, they could be leukocytes, they could be neutrophils, they could be PMNs, you know, the polymorphonuclear uh, leukocytes. Uh, PMNs are uh, white blood cells that are irregularly shaped, and that's why oftentimes they are mistaken for amoeba or vice versa. Um, so it, white blood cells not, are not always just a round circle. They can be irregularly shaped. Uh, this looks like it potentially it could be a PMN here. This is, it could be either a neutrophil, leukocyte. That's a PMN. See how it's irregularly shaped? All right, so this is a C. This is a sick patient meaning there could be a lot of periodontal disease going on with that patient, even though there wasn't an abundance of bad bacteria, a lot of white blood cells. So I'm gonna have a conversation with that patient about um, the periodontal condition. Okay, now we see a lot of activity here. We see a lot of, of eyes running around. There's your big, beautiful white blood cell. That, it's a good indicator that your body's working, right? It, it shows me that your immune system is kicking in. So that's in a way a good thing. But um, the fact that I see all this high activity and all these white blood cells, this is an active disease patient that I wanna make sure it gets um, taken care of. A lot of these white blood cells are 
looks like either leukocytes or neutrophils, something like that's a dead one or dying one. That's a PMN because it's irregularly shaped, irregularly shaped PMN. That's a regular um, shaped uh, white blood cell. That's a dead white blood cell. Because the dead ones, you're gonna see there's really, and this one's a dying one. You see there's very little cytoplasmic granules in there. That looks like a potentially an amoeba in there. That's, you can see here a lot of gliding rods, a lot of spirochetes. So here I have a patient that, okay, I see a lot of white blood cells. I see a lot of pathogens. Okay, this is an active patient. I'm gonna do a bacterial reduction on that patient. I'm gonna put them on a list of supplements at home for a couple of weeks, get them back, do the bacterial reduction. Then I'm gonna start my SRP. I'm not gonna start SRP immediately on a patient like this because there's too much stuff going on in the cavicular space. I don't wanna cause a septic situation for that patient. And plus I want my patient to heal well from my perio SRP. Because if, they're that, if there's that much, that much pathogens in there, they're not gonna uh, respond as well. This study is showing that white blood cells in and of itself is a high indicator for cardiovascular disease. So this is why it's important for us to be able to recognize that on our slide. Worm perfumonis, uh, excuse me, uh, P micros. It's gram positive anaerobic. This is something that you may find. In my career, I have very rarely seen it, but this particular patient had a mouth full of it. So this is the one time that if you see something like this, it's a gram positive anaerobe, but it's pathogenic. They're not modal. So a lot of times we can mistake and say, well, things are not modal. You're good, you're healthy. No, this is a disease. Because you're gonna see this slide again in a, a little bit later and I'm running short on time. I might have to do part two or can I run late, Barb? All right, how, how much time? How much I'm gonna time? go a little bit quicker. That's fine. Go I mean, I, I'm, I'm happy to have you come back, Fran, so. Okay. So you you do I I want everybody to know how to do this. So okay. I will leave it in your hands. Um, so I have other pathogens to go through. So do we finish? Do I just blow through some of these and just do it very quickly, or do you want to stop stop ask questions and then we'll go through the other pathogens next time? You tell me. Um, well, ladies, um, why don't we vote in the chat? Can everybody stay for a few more minutes? Um, what do you think, Fran? 15 minutes, 30 minutes? What What are you looking at time-wise? Um, maybe 115, maybe uh, like 15 minutes or uh, less. I'm just going to go through these real quick. I'm not even going to go over those. Okay, I'm going to start from here and then we're going to be good. Okay, so let's right. just go to, to if, you, if it's 15 minutes extra. Um, and, and we can record, we're recording this. So if people need to leave, they can come back and listen to the rest okay. of it another time. So I did, I did adjust my deck, but unfortunately it didn't save. Thanks. Thanks. PowerPoint server. So, <laughs> okay. Excellent. Take it away, Fran. All right. So now I just blew through some of that and it was basically talking about, like I mentioned earlier about quorum sensing. Some of this bacteria will tend to talk to each other. And if you want more information about what quorum sensing is, what is the aggregation, we can do another part two another day. You know, Barb will let me know. This is a patient uh, which I showed you earlier. If you see here, that is crenation. If you saw that red blood cell, that's because the um, uh, there's another crenated red blood cell. It's coming too fast. But these are these spirochetes look like, um, and you see a lot of white blood cells. Those spirochetes look like they were um, like a more mature spirochete because they're more coiled and their motility is much faster. And it looks like there's even F nucleatum running around in there. Um, those long, long spindly looking things like, like that, those, those two that just ran across the screen. Um, it's important for us to know the difference if there's a nascent or a mature biofilm, like I mentioned earlier, because my mature, uh, more chronic patient, I'm gonna probably have them on a longer regimen of potentially systemic uh, uh, supplements, et cetera, or, or actually add a different supplement because they're more of chronic uh, situation. So going to patient this, they're like, okay, yeah, whatever you have to do, get that out of my mouth. Yes, I understand. That's why my gums are bleeding, I get you. We're going to definitely have to do something about it. Now, this is another patient with spirochetes. You can see how this activity is certainly going to get your patient to want to accept treatment. 
The thing is, these spirochetes, they are a little less active, and you see how they're more loosely coiled? So these are more nascent or more um, early spirochetes. These are your more mature spirochetes, the ones that are more uh, tightly coiled. These are loosely coiled and moving slow. Those are newer, and then you have your more mature. So this is a patient that is full of high-risk bacteria. I'm not seeing a whole lot of uh, white blood cells. Um, so that's why, because the body's just starting to kick in. They may be in newly um, inoculated. There's like a dead white blood cell up there. So this is a patient I would definitely recommend doing a bacterial reduction on. And they'll be like, because uh, when you see a patient with spirochetes, you say, well, this is a bacteria that can get into your bloodstream and go to the brain because it's been shown that this is a causative factor in, her, in uh, Alzheimer's disease. So, and I, I know this is not how it works, but you say, well, your mouth is this close to your brain. So, you know, you, sometimes you have to kind of, I don't want to say scare them, but, you know, so they kind of, it clicks. Why it's so important to um, reduce the bacteria load in the mouth. Okay, this is obviously a highly diseased patient. There are so many spirochetes, they're like on top of each other, they can barely move. Um, this is an advanced periodontal patient. This is an easy patient to be able to show them active disease. My son, when he was at his younger age, would go out doing his clubbing times and he I did a slide for him, he came for a hygiene, and this is what a slide looked at. I looked at him and I'm like, bro, who you been kissing? He wanted to fall through the floor, especially mom finding it. He refuses to get a slide ever since then. But that's how you get it, through kissing, through intimate contact. And I'm like, so you're going out to the clubs. I'm, I'm sure, you know, like, I know what's going on. Been there, done that. So this is a patient that you're also having a conversation with them about their significant other. You know, this is a time that you're not only talking about the disease they have, but this is communicable that either you're getting it from them or you can get it to your uh, significant other. That's why they need to have the therapy. And usually I would always recommend that partner get treatment also. If you don't believe that the spirochetes can get into the bloodstream, this is going to show you that it does. This is not a plaque sample. This is a blood sample. This is These are red blood cells in plasma. And you see the spirochete swimming in there. So that being said, if we don't address that biofilm and we're only removing calculus, we're keeping that patient at risk. And now you know you can't unlearn it. That being said, I want you guys to really pay attention. So if you're doing salivary testing, fabulous. If you're not, I'm gonna ask you to start. There's several different companies that do it. Um, there's a there's at least three that I know of that are, are doing it. No, actually there's four um, that, that do it. If, if you're uh, doing microscopes, wonderful. If you're not, if you're thinking about it, I'm gonna urge you to, to do that. Though so you're gonna be able to help your patients. At the end of the day, that's why we're doing what we do, right? Um, Actually, if your patient, this is telling you that if your patient's not responding, it's because the spirochetes are being left behind. If the patient's uh, continuing having uh, periodontal conditions, we want to make sure that it, uh, we're, we're removing positive fat, and those are your pathogens. Biting rods. This is where I'm sensing. I mentioned earlier, see how they're starting to flow in the same direction? That's why you don't want to disrupt your samples. When you take your sample and you start mixing them together, like aggressively, you're gonna bust that all up. Now, because that's quorum sensing, I know that this is a mature uh, biofilm. This patient's uh, not disturbed that area for a period of time. So I'm gonna have a different conversation with this patient than I would somebody who had um, something that looks like this overall. Here you have um, spirochetes and gliding rods, both gram negative bacteria. Sorry, that thing, I'm getting dizzy, but that thing's flying back and forth. Still looking for another um, disease spot. These are spirochetes, they're fairly new. You can see they're slower moving. Um, sometimes I'll say it's not necessarily the uh, amount of the bacteria, it's the type of the bacteria and their motility and their maturity levels, what you wanna look at. The more mature, like for example, the spirochetes, the more mature, the higher the motility, the more active, um, it's gonna uh, assault the immune system and they're gonna have more active disease that's gonna progress much faster. So it's not always the amount, it's the motility and the type and the age of that 
bacteria. So a lot of times you'll see these gliding rods along with spirochetes. Now, it's, it's, on occasion, you'll see them by themselves. Just wanted to show you uh, what that would look like. Here you have um, gliding rods running around, obviously, and spirochetes. There's a couple of gliding rods stuck together. This is Materia alba. This is because there is a lot of motility here, even though the spirochetes aren't moving that quickly, this is a patient that I definitely want to do bacterial reduction on because this is like a 50-50. Um, if I had an abundance of good healthy bacteria and not a lot of um, high risk, I might have them modulated at home with certain home care recommendations and then have them back in two weeks and we slide. If I don't see a lot clinically as far as breakdown, I will say, you know what? I see a lot of good bacteria, but I see a lot of bad bacteria too. So you're like right on that precipice. I want to see if we can get you crowded in real kind of quick. And we're going to see if we can, um, what we can do to try to reduce that, those bacteria at home first. And I want you to do X, Y, Z, and then at home. And then we're going to have you back two weeks. I'm going to re-slide you. It's like a 15 minute appointment. I re-slide them and we see where we're at. If there's no change, then they're getting a bacteria reduction. If they can get it taken care of, beautiful. I want you to keep doing what you're doing. I'm going to see you in three months. I'm not seeing you in six months. I'm going to see you in three months. And if things still look good, then I'm going to put you back on your normal six months. I'm not going to let my patient get away. I'm not going to say, okay, you're good. If it looks good, I'm not going to say, okay, you're good for the next six months. No, I'm going to see you again in a tighter schedule because I'm not going to let you get on. Um, unraveled again. My recommendations, I'm not telling you to do that. It's just my recommendation. I find that works quite well because the patients that are coming to our office are looking for guidance, they're looking to be healthy. So I usually ever get feedback from, um, back from that. Now, these are your candida. Um, sometimes they be confused when you have the mother cells and the daughter cells, they can kind of look like red blood cells. Um, this is a, a, a moving, you can see that something moving, but you can see the hypha is not moving. So again, these are opportunistic things like uh, cheese curls, whatever they're called, Cheetos. Um, this is a, a, if you see a lot of candida, you want to make sure that you can address that uh, with the patient. I often don't see a lot of this, so, but it's just good to know what you're looking at if you happen to see it on the slide. This is my favorite. I love these. Amoeba, they're a one-celled animal. They use a leg to pull themselves around. They're often mistaken for a white blood cell when they're not moving. How you can tell the difference is there's no cytoplasmic annuals inside of them. There's things that make it look effervescent. There's a food vacuole inside of it, and that's what's going to be able to, uh, you're going to be able to tell the difference. It is now found to be causative of disease. Abundance of spirochetes. Let's look at the spirochetes by itself. That's a patient that's sick. There's your amoeba right here. It's hardly moving, so it's hard. It's easy to miss it. It's easy to, uh, and actually, if you see, it's this long thing right here. You can watch it slowly moving. You guys can see that? This might be another one over here. It's hard to tell. But this long one right here. There's another big one, my, sorry, this is, there's another big one right here, all right? So, if you see a blob like that, but even, you know, initially, you say, oh, there's something here, but then you have to really look, you can see that long one here. Why is it important to find the amoeba? They're a little bit harder to get rid of than you can, than the bacteria, but because of the study showing that if amoeba is there, you're going to have a um, higher incidence of pathogens getting into the uh, epithelial cells. Now, this is in my lectures. I often tell, like to say, ask people, okay, come up to the come up to the screen. And I want you to point out the white blood cells and the amoeba to me. And um, sometimes, if you don't know anything about the microscope, it's a little hard. So uh, I'm going to point them out to you because I'm sure you can figure it out already. Your amoeba is right here. Why? You can see these like little dots in here and uh, it had, you see the two nuclei inside. All right. And then you see in here, there's like one food vacuole. 
And then here, there's no, none of those little dots. And there's like one food vacuole here. It doesn't have those nuclei. That, that's how you can tell the difference. Also, what I find is a big help is they tend to be, have a little bit of a grayer, uh, a darker grayer hue around them. Because oftentimes they like to hide in the materia alba and you can find them in the materia alba uh, by looking for that grayish hue. Oh, there you go. This is a dying or dead uh, white blood cell, dying or dead white blood cell right here. These are all active white blood cells. Obviously, the immune system's working. Lots of spirochetes, gliding rods, amoeba. This is a sick patient. They are definitely getting a bacterial reduction for sure. Um, if not, also, and there's more another amoeba here. I usually, if is like three or four amoeba in this patient's mouth, lots of white blood cells. That's a part of PMN. We just went by. So this um, active disease, patients are going to be like, yes, I don't care what you have to do. I want this out of my mouth. Okay. Another amoeba, you can see this is moving very slowly. This is its food vacuole. If they're not moving, does it mean they're not living? Sometimes they're sleeping. You can see this one's moving very slowly. I'm going to show you the same one over here. I was filming it because I thought it was going to eat a white blood cell because that's what it wants to eat. But actually, it was coming to meet his friend over here. But this is highly active, very, very actively paranormally uh, involved patient. Having them see this. And when you're showing them your, their slide, you're having a conversation. Say, this is great. Your immune system is working, but there's a lot of white blood cells. Was an indication there's an infection going on. And what's causing that infection is you see these bacteria running around. These ones that look like snakes, those are the ones that can actually get into your brain and cause Alzheimer's. And these amoeba, these are actually parasites. But you know what? It's a great day that we, and what do you mean it's a great day? It's a great day because we found them. And now that we found them, I know how to help you to get rid of them. Will you allow me to help you? And the patient's like, please, anything you need to do to get rid of it. This is a 24-year-old. This is an important one I want to show you. This is a 24-year-old man, and he had predominantly nothing more than three millimeters. He had isolated four millimeters, I think, in two quadrants, scant bleeding on probing in only the posterior area. You can see there's really not a lot of activity here. There's like a spirochete here. There's a spirochete on the bottom trying to eat that white blood cell. Not a lot of activity, but there's a very active amoeba here. Didn't see the amoeba right away, but something on the slide made me keep looking because there's not a lot of stuff going on here, but there's something I found that made me say, there's got to be something. What I did is I saw all these white blood cells. When I see a sea of white blood cells, that means I know there's something going on. That's why I'm gonna keep looking. And sure enough, I found there was amoeba. And then also um, I had, uh, asked them a lot of questions. You had a lot of cats. Uh, at home. Why is that important? I'm going to tell you a story when I get to the trichomonad, which is uh, another parasite. Study showing that the um, Antimibus univalis enables the other bacteria to get into the tissue because it, in, it, it embeds itself into the epithelium, opens up the pathway, it destroys the tissue, and it opens up the pathway for the other bacteria to get in, whether it be PG, AA, trichomonad, doesn't matter. So with them there, they're like, you know, the bouncer. They're like <laughs> opening the door for everything to, to cause more problems. And this is showing that if we can eliminate that parasite, we'll improve your uh, patient's outcomes. So that's why you need to do the microscope with the salivary testing, because salivary testing, actually I've had conversations with Dr. Uh, Dr. Neighbors, and, you know, we're in talks about how, seeing how we get that taken care of, um, because, you need to know if they're there or not. Trichomonads, another parasite. There are three different types. You have trichomonad oralis, trichomonad annex, and trichomonad, trichomonad um, uh, vaginalis. So, trichomonads, they look like little rats. This is a patient that was acutely and chronically diseased. I showed him his slide. He could care less. He did not accept perio treatment. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. 
you're not going to get everybody to accept the treatment. They don't own their disease. You can only do the best you can. But if you see something like this on the patient's slide, with, especially with a lot of the activity of the other bacteria, that's a very diseased patient. You want to have a conversation with that patient about how to get rid of it and how do they get it. I had a patient who was about 65 years old. Here's another trichomonia. And if you look closely, it keeps turning around on it in and of itself. You're going to see its pleomorphic tongue stick out and eat the bacteria. Had a patient, we treated her for periodontal disease. And she kept coming back. We re-slide her every time and um, after periotherapy, and she kept having trichomonas. After the second time post-SRP, there's still trichomonas, I went knee to knee to her, and I went eye to eye. I said, okay, we need, we need to figure out how, why we're not getting rid of the trichomonas, because she was compliant with her supplements, she's compliant with her home care, and we couldn't figure out why. And long story short, she had cats at home, I made her put, um, this is pre-pandemic, I made her put um, Purell next to her couch and wherever she sits and touches the cat. I said, make sure you wash your hands before you touch the uh, food and water bowl of your cat. I want you to clean all your counters down, make sure everything's clean. Everything you, every time you touch your cat or feed your cat, wash your hands. And then continue your supplements on a see you in two weeks. Everything was gone. She kept getting re-inoculated by the cat. That's why, as, as biological hygienists, we have to look outside the box. We can't just, you know, accept things as face value. We have to really keep finding that root cause or keep digging, finding out why that patient is diseased. Now, here you have a, you have like the full smorgasbord here. Here you have the, the trichomonad. Here he's burying himself into the, the materia alba. You have a huge amoeba here. These are our red blood cells. The thing is, this one's a little bit lighter because the lighter red, red blood cells, they're less oxygenated. There's not as much oxygen, so they're a little bit lighter. Here you have the spirochetes, sliding rods. Here you have another huge amoeba. So this patient is very sick. When you see a lot of this, you're a lot of you know less oxygenated red blood cells because you know maybe you even have to have a conversation with the patient. They, they need to see their PCP because you know there's less oxygen in there. Uh, in their system, obviously, because the red blood cells are white. So as a conventional hygienist, do you look at the other stuff? No. We're healthcare providers, and we're offering health care to our patients that no others are. There's another pomona. It's just, it's like I said, it's buffet. Again, this is something that you can find that you're not going to get in your salivary testing because there have been studies that show that it's very causative. Remember the P micro slide I showed you earlier? This is that same patient. Oh, watch. Just wait for it. There it goes. This big, fat, juicy one. He's now gotten so fat, eaten so much of the bacteria. He sat there, and he's just now waiting for everything to come to him. And he's just spitting out his tongue, and he's going to eat all that bacteria. So my point is, earlier we looked at that slide. It didn't look like there was anything going on because that P micro was not moving. But there's also trichomonas there. So you really have to pay attention to what you're looking at. This patient it was an active perio patient. They didn't have the classic spirochetes and gliding rods and all that. They had different, they presented differently. You're not gonna see that just looking clinically. That's why you really need to look with this microscope. This study is showing that there's a connection between the trichomonas and periodontal disease. So it's often found in advanced periodontal cases. So if you're eliminating both the entomibogen valves and the tenex, actually that slide shows, um, we're going to improve the environment of the patients uh, periodontally. Oh, want to be a dentist specialist. Why? Because we are here to prevent disease, not treat disease. You want to be aggressive periodontal protocol. When I say aggressive, not trying to make them do something they don't need. I, my, my favorite patient is that patient who is a three millimeter and I find amoeba on them and I show them and they're like, please do the bacterial reduction. I'll take the supplements. I get them. I eliminate that amoeba. And now that patient remains and stays healthy. I can't tell you how many patients I've had that like that. So if we're only using periodontal charting and bleeding on probing and radiographic calculus 
and um, bone loss as our markers for diagnosing periodontal disease, we're missing the mark. We are not taking care of our patients the way we need to, because I want to prevent symptoms. If I can prevent symptoms, I am now truly a healthcare provider. And I really want to thank you guys for taking that time to spend your morning with me. I know I kind of blew through that. Um, this is usually a three-hour minimum lecture. I kind of squeezed into one hour. <laughs> so I want to thank you. You shifted from just treating to now preventing. Thank you, guys. Oh, thank you, Fran. I, mm -hmm. I, I loved all your trichomonad slides. Those are just amazing. <laughs> yeah, the, the first time you ever find one, it's like, wow. I know. Uh, it's it's very exciting. Exciting. It is. Thank you, Fran. That was great. Oh, my pleasure. Our, Any questions? We need a deeper dive. <laughs> okay, so our questions. Um, hey, Fran. Yes. Can, can a hygienist own a microscope? Sure. If her her uh, dentist is kind of hesitant or really can't see the value in it, I'm sorry. I'm not, I, 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 I oh, can we? Do we stop recording? Um, it no. We okay. can edit. No, that's fine. The the value is there, but yes, the the, the short answer is yes. Absolutely, you can. Uh, there's no reason why you can't. Can't. Um, the thing is, we're not allowed to diagnose. So we can say, I see these bacteria. I know what they are. I'm just concerned because it looks like, you know, they're potentially causing, it's causing your periodontal disease. I'm going to definitely have your doctor, my doctor, take a look at that. You know, so we can't diagnose, we cannot diagnose periodontal disease. We know, you know, just like in, in, in medicine, you know, nurses know what they're looking at, but they can't say what it is. It's the same situation. So we have to have a conversation with a doctor. So sometimes, you know, until they can actually see the value in it, because at the end of the day, if you look at this, you, you show the patient the, the treatment that they need, patient accepts the treatment that they need, patient gets healthy, the office makes revenue, the production for hygiene goes up, it's a win, win, win across the board. It wins for you because now you know you're truly delivering therapy that the patient needs because that, that's my genesis. We, we get so much satisfaction out of that. The patient gets healthy. That's number one. And then the office is making production. That's a win for the office. So if, even if they don't see it, with, without using it, they don't see the value. But once they see it, they're going to know the value of it for sure because they're going to see the numbers going up, more patients accepting treatment, more patients are getting healthy. I can't see it being in another way. They answer the question? Yeah. Okay. So um, somebody asked, Amy asked what supplements you recommend, Fran? Um, every office is different. Every um, Everybody has their own protocols. Uh, in general, um, I like to incorporate in my protocols things like colloidal silver, um, things that have oregano in it, um, something to balance the pH. Again, everybody is different. Some doctors don't want their hygienists to pick the protocol. They want to do it themselves. Some offices, the doctors are a, a naturopathic doctor, and they want to set the protocols for the patients. So it's, I don't, I'm a little hesitant to give you a protocol per se, okay. the only because of the fact that um, every office is different. Um, a lot of the coaching I do with, with, my, uh, with my offices, um, again, I leave that up to them. I give them guidelines because um, I work with some of you may know I'm um, associate director of the IBDM, but I'm also a member of the IOMT. We're sisters. And, um, you know, some of the offices I, I work with, you know, depending on what you're, you're looking for. But definitely I would use like a colloidal silver. Colloidal silver is great for our um, patients that have the, the trichomonads and uh, amoeba. Um, things with like oregano, um, there's, there's several different ones. Uh, I don't want to say a particular brand. Okay. Uh, something that has oregano in it because uh, that's a natural antibiotic because you want to address everything systemically also. 
not just a, um, a localized uh, treatment. Uh, something for pH, uh, not just a localized treatment, something that is localized and systemic. One of the biggest, uh, the easiest ones is like an aloe vera juice, gel, right? Aloe vera juice, patients, people drink aloe vera juice um, for their pH. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend lemon water. Uh, I want patients drinking lemon water because of the erosion on their teeth. You can use a straw, but I want to use something that's confirmed, you know, that I can use intraorally and systemically. So something like an aloe vera gel juice. Okay. Um, yeah, about, depending on what I would recommend, depending on the what pathogens are in their mouth. Okay. This is like a, um, and we're going to have to talk about this bar, like a bio, uh, um, biological perio 101. Like we, I, we I love that do idea. We yes. need to do to talk more biological hygiene, like your regular 110 patient, then you have your bacteria reduction patient, then you have your perio patient. What do you do? What do you, how do you address it? Like, what are your different tiers? Like, so this is like, this is this is like a weekend lecture. This is <laughs> and we're already There's so much to this. Yeah. We're scratching the surface. Yes. All right. So um, can you give us just an estimate of a startup cost for a microscope? Um you can get a really inexpensive one, like on Amazon, for a few hundred dollars. How good is it? Um, there is a microscope company. I mean, I'm, I'm an art tech girl. I love Bill Landers. He's been with the Academy for years. Um, unfortunately, because of COVID, he's not been coming to our, our, um, our conferences. So I'm a Bill Landers girl for sure. But there is another company that has a microscope that is much smaller uh, footprint to it. It's much smaller scope. And um, they run about 2,700, 20 you know, 2,800, which I know is a lot. It may sound like a lot. You could even get microscopes that are even less expensive, like 1,500. Um, but if you can invest, I would invest in something that is going to be sturdy and it's going to last you a little while. Because I'm going to tell you, once you start using a microscope, your case of symptoms is going to start going through the roof. You're going to start doing... You know, even if a patient's on an SRP, I said it a thousand times, say it again, patients that are three, maybe a couple of local or four millimeters, you're now doing bacterial reductions on them. You're not doing SRP. So you're going to be increasing your revenue. Mm -hmm. So even if you're an independent contractor or you have independent practice, you're doing mobile dentistry, you're going to be doing more therapy on your patients. So it's basically it's going to wind up cost, paying for itself in no time. Mm -hmm. So that, that upfront investment is going to pay for itself. It's oh, paid. Yeah. Absolutely. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. So, Do you remember what the, the insurance code is? For? For a microscope slide. Um, yeah. We, we have a code, but we made a code. It's like 999 point something because yeah. we don't charge for it. Yeah. If you want to charge, okay. My recommendation is suggestion. I wouldn't even charge. It's part of the protocol. Yeah. If you want to charge, you can. Yeah. This because at the end of the day, if I'm using a tool that I'm going to, because if I'm going to use a tool that I'm, I'm going to show my patient their disease and it's going to get them to say yes to treatment, because again, it's not about the money. I don't care about the money. I care about getting my patients well. I want to get. It's like sometimes the patients show disease. I said I'll do. For, it's like I want to say I'll do it for free. Please let me help you. Please, I beg you, let me help you. Just yeah, gonna get I, that come on out, out of there. Oh my god, please let me help you. And so me charging that extra five dollars or whatever you want to charge or twenty dollars, because it could it, it's nominal cost to be able uh to take that slide and the patient's gonna say yes to yeah. therapy. And then plus one what, another thing you can do is if you are incorporating the microscope into your practice, you can actually increase the um the fee for your protease. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we did. And just rolled the fee in. So well, the fee but I know there is a, a microscope, a bacterial assessment code, a bacterial code. And I, I don't remember it. So I've been at a clinical for a few years now. So I do, I can try to find that out. Yeah, I it's, still associate with an office, but yeah. I, um, and, and I, I can look it up too. So I can yeah. share that. 
But the thing is, with a lot of our uh, patients, a lot of our offices, we're um, you want to get the patients reimbursed. But a lot of our offices, we don't uh, necessarily subscribe yeah. to that because insurance companies I'm looking at dictate treatment. Of hygienist, a dental hygienist. She's very famous. She used people's saliva to put a um, microscope to test their bacteria in their mouths. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. So iPad lady, who are you? I hope I'm not. I hope I'm mute. Oh shoot, I'm mute. No, you're not. <laughs> okay. I, okay. I thought it was a question. <laughs> okay. All right. And then our last question uh, from Sandra is um, do microscope companies provide training and support? Usually um, not. I believe Oratech has some people that they can send out. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I know you do training, right, Cora? Mm -hmm. I do training. I yeah. actually, um, I think I might be in Washington State Ooh. next month. Ooh, good. And, okay. Yes. Good. So I might, have to, we might have to meet up, yes. So I do training, Barbara does training. I know um, there's another hygienist in Canada. She does training. Mm -hmm. um, those are the three that I know of. And I know there's a there's somebody in um, in uh, Tennessee. They have training. Mm -hmm. So, but you have to go on site. Yeah. You know, I come to you or I do online. Um, I think the, the one in, Cal in uh, Canada, she also does on site or online. So, yes, but unfortunately, I think Oratech, I think they do have people they can send uh, to you. Um, but other than that, no, not, not that I'm aware of. I mean, I know Bill has, um, from Oratech, has a manual and he has videos. Right. So, right. so and, and then we're here to help you. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you have questions, we can certainly, certainly work with you on this. And there's Zoom. I love Zoom. All right, did we answer all your questions? All right, well, Fran, you're gonna to have to come back for round two because this is just scratching the surface. Yes. I just, and I appreciate all your time. This is, I love this stuff. This is wonderful. Yeah, it's about making sure that we deliver the best care we can to help our patients. We, um, as holistic or biological hygienists, that's our goal is not just to scrape teeth, not just remove calculus, not to just make their teeth look pretty. It's healthcare. And when we recognize that um, and being able to look outside the box, looking at everything else other than what we see in the locally in their mouth is when we become true healthcare um, providers and, and healing. Uh, in their healing. Right? Yeah. Yes, for sure. So, all right, ladies, next month, we are going to be hearing from Sandra, um, who's a, who's in our audience today, and she's going to be talking about herbals, uh, being an herbalist, and how, and how she uses herbs in her um, periotherapy. So I encourage you to, to join us next month, first Saturday of the month, and to get your CE codes, um, please email Kim Smith at the IAOMT, you should all have her email address. If you don't just touch base with me and I will get that to you. Um, so thank you, Fran. And thank you ladies for joining us. I hope you learned something and I hope, um, you know, if you have more questions, shoot me an email and, and I'm happy to answer them. So, all right, thank you.